Welcome to the 13th episode of the Most Serious Podcast. You know how we Indians get very excited when we hear about a new recipe that's been going around on the internet or when we hear about that new place that just opened up around the street and we want to try their exotic beautiful food out. In today's episode, I had the greatest of pleasure talking to Mr. Sovir Saran, who is a global celebrity when it comes to international brand of cooking. Sovir Saran was the first chef to bag a Michelin star for a non-European restaurant in the US. He brought a new meaning to the Indian food uh, in the United States and he also abolished some stereotypes that were associated with the Indian food. We talk about how this journey of becoming a top chef began and how this 21 year old kid went from new delhi to bombay to study visual arts and then from bombay to new york we tried to talk about the life in new york and in 1992 in 1993 what were the major differences that he felt in new delhi and in the us so where saran is not just a chef he is an entrepreneur he's an author and he's just the brand that so where saran is all about he has written successful best selling books like Masala Farm Indian Home Cooking and American Masala and he's releasing one more book which is close to his heart and uh, it's called Instamatic it's a uh, chef's deeper more thoughtful look into today's insta world we will talk about the culture and history of recipes and the rich stories that are associated with each recipe we talk about the life in new york cooking health and nutrition we also discuss do top chefs like sovir saran have cravings for a midnight snack at 3 am and in the end we try to figure out the meaning of life the purpose of life and how sovir saran ji views life and what are his perspectives his learnings that he picked up along the way let's get into the episode now sovir saran sir thank you so much for doing this welcome to the most serious podcast Thank you for having me, Rupudamit. Now, above all, before anything else, I want to ask: What was the last meal you cooked? What was the last meal I cooked? Um, hmm. You know, the last thing I made a meal. I don't know. The last thing I made was a jamun ka char. You know, the jamun are in season, and um, the palwala, the fruit vendor. a uh, very naughtily gave the uh, what the guard a box of um, uh, a pulse of jamun telling him i had uh, ordered them i just looked at them and i didn't even <laughs> think i would get them because i do i'm not a big fan of jamun you have to put too much masala and all for them to go into your mouth easily so um, we had it i now i had a kilo of jamuns what do i do we made a beautiful achar and the achar is delicious so that is the last thing i cooked but the before then i'd made uh, last week an incredible shetty biryani a uh, 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 mutton biryani that was made karnataka style from the shetty uh, bunt community of uh, karnataka so it's okay. made with chutney and kadhi patta and sambar puri and all kinds of yummy spices that people in northern india don't assume a part of biryani making so that was what i made last so when you talk about these uh exquisite recipes and these awesome meals that you cook so there's a there's a rich history and culture that also you tell about it like you were telling about the south indian uh, biryani that you made so do you study that history while making those dishes or does that come naturally to you or how does that happen so you know you have to um, of course you study a little bit but it's not a study that you do because you're cooking uh in my case i'm a curious person i love people i love travel i love differences in human beings i love the other i love my friends who are not uh kayas who are not hindu who are not north indian who are not indian so the other whether it's christian muslim sikh uh jewish parsi and gypsy and uh, gay and bisexual or questioning whatever the other is It, that person is even more exciting to me because in getting to know them i learn new things i become a richer person i become a kinder human being i become a more aware uh, human being i have seen more of the world i 
uh, learn a new recipe, I learn about a new community, I learn about a new way of thinking, I evolve and I continue in the Vedantic tradition of growth of uh, the world being one village, Vasudevaya Kutumbakam, that the world is one village, right. the global village. So I live that. You have to live that journey. If you're not living it, you are a racist, a bigot, a fascist, an extremist, all the wrong things that the world should not have in their community. So when you live with open eyes and ears that can hear, a body that can feel, eyes that see, um, uh, hands that can touch, a heart that feels, that's when you live a full life. And if you live that, you get all these recipes, the stories, the cultural nuance. They come very easy. You don't have to go studying. They become part of your life. You just delve into it. And you you might also find them very interesting, I think, uh, by the nature that you're sounding. I think it 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 is exciting for you to learn all these new cultures and these stories that are attached. So, you know, every recipe has a story. Their recipes are, of course, uh, sometimes connected to a community or a state or a region. But when you go looking with a magnifying glass, they're connected to the man, woman, child, uh, cook, staff member, whoever has made it. The dark bungalow uh, uh, orderly whose job it was to cook for the officers coming in to stay at the bungalow. They all add their inflection, their story, their nuance, their personal histories into that recipe. So recipes like human beings are not static. Human beings that are static are the Atankwads and the terrorists because they are living in a didactic manner and they're fighting with each other because they don't want to grow. A human being that grows brings their own personality, their joy, their sorrows, their hopes, their desires, their travels, their families, uh, uh, growth all into a recipe. So if uh, uh, in India, think about if there was a Khansama cooking for a, a Maharaja of Jaipur, when mm. Marani Gaitri Devi went abroad and came back, she brought with her new ingredients, new spices, new dreams, new hopes, new aspirations, and new tastes. So when she sat at the table and the Khansama made something and Marani Gaitri Devi ate it, she would have said, <laughs> so I had parsley and it to get better. So the Khansama now had a seed for parsley, grew it and now started using parsley. Next time she said, we Beirut in Beirut, so we had to grind it in Pudine, we had to grind it in Daite. We call it to Labna, and when you eat it, you can see that it will change the way of your mind. And then the mint add to it, dry mint. So this is, like uh, we say in uh, the study of language, Bhasha ka manak roop, the evolving face of language. And the same thing happens with cuisine, that if you're a human being with a brain that thinks, if you have a, a, a mind that wants to wander and grow, there is no other way to live than to grow. And when you grow, your food evolves. When you evolve, your food evolves with you. You learn new tricks. When you learn new tricks, you go further. And mm -hmm. that's why the greatest chefs have never gone just to study in a school or an institution. They do that. But they then travel, they learn, they educate, they're active politically, socially. They care about the hungry in their community. They care about the uh, fruits and vegetables growing in the farms. They are uh, concerned about who is growing them, what their lives are like, because even the person's sweat going into the growth and produce of vegetable changes the quality of the vegetable. Because in your mind, you don't have guilt that there's somebody unpaid, uncared for working for you. So the circle, it's a full circle of life. And the more sooner we realize that the world is an echo chamber, the more seriously we become better humans and your podcast will affect better, richer lives. So, you know, we, we have to be serious about the fundamentals of life and living, which are treat the other as you want to be treated yourself. And when we think like that, there is no difference between two human beings. We see the, we see the humanity in the other, their food becomes our food our food becomes their food. When no boundaries exist, the sponge-like quality in which we absorb from one another heighten our experiences. That doesn't mean we forget what we do. Our culture, our traditions, our rituals, we only get better at implementing them, preserving them, caring for them, and uh, celebrating them because we are not doing it in a didactic manner, but we are doing it with very richly nuanced thought about how can I make them even more glorious and reach them take them farther away 
and more people will celebrate our rituals when we are not telling them it's only my way or the highway we can teach <laughs> hindu rituals to muslims sikh sikhs christians jews because we show them in good light inclusivity rather than exclusivity so when we become inclusive people our reach spreads we be, we can spread our wings so far that the world is our playground we are not limited to just our geography so we have to think as bigger people and our mission our rituals our social constructs they get much more audience and get become better versions of themselves right so i want to know like uh, when this young 21 year old kid i i would call you a kid at that point because i am nearing 20 but i don't think i am a grown up so when this 21 or a 21 year old subir saran decides to go to new york city how did that change happen how why did you not go down the traditional routes of doctors lawyers engineers in india i did i wanted to be a doctor but i wasn't willing to work as hard to get incredible marks <laughs> in chemistry so i had to make a choice do i suffer chemistry to become a doctor or do i the other thing i wanted to be was an artist so uh, it, my mother helped my father understand that if their son couldn't be the artist he wanted to be whose child should be an artist mm. we had enough doctors in the family we had enough lawyers and architects and engineers and babus bureaucrats and educators we didn't have an artist a professional artist in our family at that point so oh we did we had one mummy ji but no boy who had studied Achha. art yeah and uh, my dadi's uh, youngest brother's wife was an incredible artist nirmal mummy ji but you know we we always have sexual constructs and what a man can do what a woman should do it wasn't that acceptable for a man to be an artist especially if he was going from school to study art so mm-hmm. here i was at, uh, at uh, 18 having to decide mai kya banunga and i said to papa mai ya to doctor banna chahta hu ya artist banna chahta hu and my mother knew that i wanted to of course be a doctor but i had the calling to be an artist i think i give more more credit to my mom that she didn't let me be broken that i didn't uh, wasn't smart enough to get to medical school because mm-hmm. i i did not want to study chemistry she just said to me do you really want to be an artist i said yes she said go chase that dream and my father agreed and i got to jj school of art in bombay and it was the most miserable college of art at that point <laughs> it was living in old laurels and old achievements were not doing anything young and exciting and fresh that art needs to survive it was choking artists rather than giving them the freedom to express themselves so i couldn't run fast enough from uh, jj to america and i arrived in new york city as at sir at school of visual arts in manhattan perhaps the greatest school for applied arts and graphic design in uh, new york city and therefore in the world um and i uh, saw freedom like i'd never seen before known before i saw people of all colors shapes sizes speaking languages like a rainbow and thinking uh, beautifully brilliantly and diverse and new york was a dream come true and it was a dream i couldn't have dreamt and as i lived there i felt i was realizing dreams that i must have had in previous lives and as they came to fruition i was the happiest man on the planet that is so amazing it 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 speaks volumes on how positive the whole uh, the whole perspective you take on this journey i think that's very beautiful so how different was new york city like living 20 years in delhi and then living i think the next 20 years you lived in and uh, new york if i'm not wrong 10 years 27 all right so, so so what was the primary differences primary difference was the one was new delhi the other was new york and beyond that the human um, mindscape the the shackles that uh, caged our human collective the burdens that uh, challenged us the vicissitudes of life that harangued us the uh, uh, daily ups and downs that occupied us and the shockingly uh, brilliant discoveries waiting to be discovered every inch that you uh, walk were both the same in new york and new delhi or bombay and new york and new delhi what was different in new york city was the um, 
construct of the people, they were mostly white, or a lot of them were black. My type that was uh, lighter brown, or to New Yorkers, a lot of them, to many, I was a, a colored man. To several, I was just a, another a pale white boy, or not pale, a tan white boy. But for the first time in my life, um, I saw racial difference. I realized that I was, in Bombay, I realized I was the other. In Bombay, the first question that people would ask me at JJ, to guys, how, what are you? And I, because I was even paler, I was even smoother, I was even younger, and my skin was supple, my hair was down to my shoulders, I was a pretty boy. Uh, I, I was everything they never imagined a boy to be. And uh, they would tell me, what are you? And I would say, human being. Nah, you understand? I said, no, I don't understand. I knew exactly understood what they wanted to know, where I was from. So Punjabi, I? I said, no, because I wasn't a full Punjabi. Rikya, I Kashmiri? I said, no. So they said, what are you? I said, I'm a human being. So that would be a long conversation. But in New York, I realized that it, that difference, that conversation on race and who you were, your ethnic makeup was even more heightened. In New York of 1993, it was a fascinating city, a city where dreams come true. All of that was true. But it was also a city that was still learning to live in, uh, in togetherness, which it did beautifully. No city in the world is as uh, celebrating of diversity as New York is. But it was still learning to be bigger and better versions of that. And I arrived there at a point of flux where we had a black mayor that had been slapped around because he was black and because he was a dreamer, and we had a fascist new mayor coming into power, Giuliani, and Rudy Giuliani was a monster, but also got New York uh, behaving. You know, dictators can get things done because they're fascist and right. they don't think about killing lives to make things happen. And Rudy was ruthless. Ruthless Rudy was had become mayor after I arrived there, and New York started becoming beautiful and clean and exciting, and for some but dangerous and scary and hateful for others. I was lucky that I became part of that majority. They accepted me. So I saw, and I was never, I never joined them in uh, being bad to the other, but I could see how race plays a life. Uh, New York was very different. It had tremendous opportunities. New York had gone through the churn that we are still going through in India of, uh, leaving old world mentalities and becoming one with tomorrow. New York has done that for, I would say, hundreds of years. So, uh, of course, Bombay is doing it, Delhi is doing it, but we are doing it as toddlers. They have now mm -hmm. become uh, 20 or 30 year olds doing it. Of course, they're not sage and wise yet, but they, are, they already have 20, 30 years, which in reality is 100 years of experience to get to being 30. So New York was exciting because in New York, I realized how uh, you must dream big, you must spread your wings far, you must stop and embrace the other for the other. You can't pretend that they are same, they're not same, but you have to accept that they're different and yet one with you. That they may look different, they may speak a different language, they may wear clothes differently, they may wear a hijab, they may wear a bindi, they may wear a ghungat, but no matter what they wear or how they talk, the humanity inside is the same. New York makes you think of that. New York questions you to accept it. New York challenges you to become one with it. And New York teaches you how to live as one. And that was the magic of New York. And it was very exciting and thrilling to be in New York in 1993, whereas as it was growing into a better version of itself, and it was doing dirty things, and it was paying attention to what wrongs were being committed, and it was challenging the powers to be to be better. So that journey of New York that I was able to be part of is a thrilling journey because I saw a city change and grow, both uglier and better, because of humans and despite humans. So it was a <laughs> thrilling place to be, that we saw the worst of humanity, the best of humanity. We saw the worst outcomes, we saw the best outcomes. And New York is a city that was able to tolerate the worst because it knew it could do better. And I was lucky to be part of that churn and come on the better side of it. Incredible description of those times. I, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I was not even like uh, aware that 
this this site was interesting because we think about like new york and you know the city of dreams and everything is just magical there because you don't have a, a first hand experience of being there but that's very incredible the way you took put it, it, it uh, 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 ripudaman it is magical because magic doesn't come out of thin air for mm. magic to exist you need foundations for right. foundations to be strong you need people that keep them uh, you know in good condition for good conditioning of those foundations you need minds that think minds that observe minds that reflect minds that challenge minds that speak up minds that speak out minds that revolt and new york had an abundance of them you don't build uh, dreams and magic out of sameness you don't build uh, something beautiful out of incest you don't build something grand out of parochial thought they come from a churn where you are challenged where you are uh, broken where you are uh, shattered but when you put yourself together when you again rise you rise for new heights you rise to scale new um, monuments of uh, success that will be looked at tomorrow by history and seen as uh, these monuments to vision that was mind blowingly of new and why because those people were daring brave un uh, they were not scared they could dream bigger than themselves fly wider than they had imagined and cast a net of hope beyond their uh, scope and horizon and those people are the people who dwell in new york city and that's why it's a city the rest are all little villages trying to be cities it's the city of the world and those people that live there are daring uh, charming kind broken angry happy but they are human and they mostly realize that their journey is a shared journey of civility where of course there are pits and falls ebbs and flows where there are ups and downs there are uh, moments that are bleak then there are those that are shining but they don't see them as black and white it's the gray scale that is the uh, you know the continuum and the collection of the all that makes it all happen together beautifully no one piece good or bad defines it it's a collection of them all that makes it tick makes it shine and makes it work like new york city does so now since we are on like the visionary ideals and the accomplishments so let's talk about suvir so saran's g's michelin star that happened and he took this indian dining on a different scale in the new york city devi and let's let's talk about that how how was the beginning of this what was the journey of the having a michelin star what did you feel about having a michelin star and so the journey began before the michelin star i wasn't that i didn't study to be a chef i didn't think i would be a chef i had no idea i'd be a chef i wanted to be an artist i would still want to be a doctor some day the chef came about because in new york city of 1993 new york city of 2000 2001 2002 there was no place where i could go to eat as an indian and be proud i would come home to delhi and there was no place i could go to as an indian at a restaurant and eat food that i would that would make me proud so i would be scratching my head that in my home in the friends of in the homes of friends and family in the homes of strangers who had invited me or Uh, a friend had brought me to i would eat grand feasts meals that would uh, blow over anybody and everybody across the world of the sophistry that is involved in indian cooking indian cooking is so fine so refined so simple so magical so pure so brilliant and yet what we see at our restaurants even at the best of them today in 2021 it's garbage because we we have no pride in our own cooking we have no uh, shame in running away from our uh, mother cuisine and uh, emulating and copying and bastardizing our own cuisine to become like the west we forget that first you have to appreciate who you are then you can become new versions of yourself similarly with cuisine if you don't understand your own cuisine you cook you can cook nothing right that's a there's macaroni and cheese in india looks like garbage it doesn't look like mac and cheese anywhere else in the world up pasta carbonara uh, penne you know we 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 picked up words of vocabulary we know just a little and now we make it and we make it so terrible but we are, we have we have 
we are mediocre in our acceptance, in our rendering, in our celebration of foods that are ghastly. No wonder the Michelin Guide has never come to India. It sees in India cuisine that it's so bad that how could you celebrate it? But what it doesn't see is the home cooking of India, which is magical. With nothing, the mothers, the house husbands, the chefs, the cooks, the Bavarchis, the Khansamas, the Pandits, the Maharaj, the food they make is so incredibly beautiful, nuanced, fresh, seasonal, regional, richly diverse, part of society, part of celebrations and festivals. That food is the food of a billion point four people that are living, dreaming, celebrating correctly. You don't see that food in our restaurants. That was the food I was craving and I brought to New York with much work and hard work and uh, challenge because everybody thought butter chicken and dal makhani defines Indian food. There were no chefs anywhere in the world at that point thinking as I was thinking of they were, I didn't know them. So that's not fair to say. I'm sure there were many thinking like I was. But uh, in the Indian context in America or in UK or in France where I had traveled, there was no restaurant doing what our homes was doing. So I dared to dream that I could do a restaurant where home cooking would be plated in a new way. Uh, uh, dishes would come together as an ensemble. As, a, uh, uh, as three or four items put together in one plate, like was done in other countries and cultures. So I wasn't changing our food. I was presenting uh, 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 lamb chop, which was, uh, could be served at Karim in Jama Masjid, with uh, 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 the dosa filling, aloos from southern India, with a tomato pachri also from southern India, and a raita on one plate. And now people say, wow, there's meat, there's a yogurt sauce, which is cool. There are hot potatoes and a fiery condiment, exactly what some Western chef would have plated a plate. And I could also tell stories. The pachri is from Andhra, the uh, uh, tomato chutney is a uh, uh, Tamilian uh, Brahminical chutney. The potatoes are from the, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, potatoes are from a dosa filling of Karnataka. The lamb chops are from a restaurant called Karim in Jama Masjid. The cook was a cook to Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor. So at every uh, plate shared five or four or three stories. That would be mm -hmm. stories that would take people into traveling in India. The food would be incredibly fresh and brilliant and light and exciting. They hadn't seen that. All of a sudden, the reviews coming in the papers and the magazines were that join Saran on a journey across India, a train ride cherry picking flavors and tastes from all the regions of India and presenting them in a plate. People had never imagined this could happen. So the stars followed, but that wasn't what I was chasing. I was wanting people to literally get jhankis of India, that each plate was a jhanki. It was mm. on the Republic Day Parade, you see those floats? Right. Each plate was a float telling a story. And it was new for that point in time. It got a lot of attention. It wasn't my story. It was the journey of India, the story of India, the story of the Indian states, the Indian people, the Indian communities, the Indian mothers, home cooks, chefs, fathers, uncles, aunts that have ever cooked for a child and their neighbors. It was their food, their cuisine, their story. I happen to be the sutradhar taking it to the people. That's incredible. So where's the answer? That's, that's really, uh, also like, uh, did you plan that, uh, like you were not planning on being a chef, but did you think that once you started out this presentation of the Indian food and also this work that you were putting in, so did you think that this would have this kind of effect? Did you thought that maybe I could make an impact? So I am an artist. I think at the core, we don't do things for effect and, um, lucrative success. Some of us, uh, but the smart ones do. So I've never, never, never done things for what will come in return. I take a challenge, a risk, I accept a challenge. I cook to please. Unlike paintings, well, artists paint to give pleasure too, but it's easier. That is a little more difficult. I think a visual artist has it even more difficult than a chef because paintings. Some people can see and feel. A lot of people don't see and feel the same way. So you can fail an artist by not seeing and feeling what they feel. But with food, of course, you can hate somebody's cooking. But you taste and you can taste what the art, artist, the culinary artist was creating. So I, I cooked and created and I um, 
invest your time and energy. And I had enough of a following already of people that thought me the best caterer in New York City, the hottest new chef, the finest food being cooked in Manhattan at homes or in a party being cooked by me. People believed that. I was lucky. I was also lucky to be in New York City in the 1990s and early 2000s when it wasn't as saturated with talent as it is today. Hmm. So whatever little noise I made was being heard and was echoing much far and wide. So I had good luck on my side. And um, I had people that were hungry to uh, learn something new. So they all get more credit than I in its success. I just happened to be an artist that was doing what he did. These kind humans, these daring individuals, these uh, hungry for the flavors of the world, residents of Manhattan and America and travelers coming to America. They supported me, they supported us, my restaurant, my chef, Imad Bato, who I cooked with. They gave us the support, the money, the time, the celebration that takes a, a dream to become a reality and become a lucrative success. So the journey is always a journey that many people are a part of. And in a culinary journey in the restaurant setting, the diners are the ultimate um, uh, uh, people that can make or break a restaurant. We were lucky that they supported us for years and years on it. Let's talk a little bit about health and nutrition also, because since we're talking about eating all these delicious foods, so I, I wondered that do top chefs like you eat snacks from their fridge at 3 a.m. in the night? And 4.30 a.m. at night, yes. <laughs> I stop at 3. I sleep, I'm up till 4, 4.30 every morning. And yes, very naughty. That's a, I don't know about uh, many chefs. I certainly do it. And I, I'm the only chef on the Nutrition Advisory Committee of Brigham and Women Hospital, a teaching arm of Harvard Medical School. And I should be a much better behaved chef. <laughs> but I also teach a course at Harvard and the Culinary Institute of America called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, where we bring in physicians and surgeons and uh, food professionals, nutritionists, dietitians to uh, understand how being mindful and eating good food and uh, beverages and all can change your medical outcomes in life. So I have that rare of, uh, uh, connection that I do this for, I've done it now for 17 years. At age 25, I was the youngest adjunct professor at New York University's uh, School of, of, of uh, Department of Nutrition and Food Studies in the School of Education. Oh. I was lucky enough at 25 to be brought in by Carol Goober, uh, an amazing lady who's since passed away, very sadly at a very young age. And the uh, guru of nutrition and food in America, Marion Nessel. They brought me in at 25 to be uh, teaching uh, food, st food studies. I would teach sauce making and uh, cooking with spices, roasting and uh, stir frying, all these. I would teach students of nutrition how to cook so they could be better uh, nutrition advisors to doctors and patients. So tw from 25, I've been teaching professionally at uh, NYU till the age of 30, then Harvard Culinary Institute from 30 to today, when I'm 48. So it's what, uh, uh, 25, 48, how to, 23 years of experience. Right. So uh, right. working with nutrition. So I, when I get up on stage, I always say, practice as I preach, not as I do. Because I have midnight cravings. My midnight begins at 2 in the morning. And sometimes I'm craving till 4.30. I'll eat ice cream. I'll eat a bag of chips. I'll eat sometimes some cookies. Other times I'll eat... Snack on nutties, the Indian the chocolate, yeah. chocolate bite. I'll eat nutties. I'll so or peanuts or cashews or almonds or something. Sometimes a coke. Sometimes all of these together. So no, we we are as human as the other person. Human beings, we literally there's nothing that differentiates us. Uh, how we look is different. How we think is pretty much very similar. Of course, we think in different languages. We uh, reach out for different snacky foods, but we're doing the same thing. The behavior is pretty much the same. So uh, my bad food may be defined. I may eat a bhelpuri at three in the morning because I'm Indian. Somebody else may be eating a hamburger because they're in America. But we are still going for those comfort foods, junk foods. The, the behavior mimics each other. This gives, I'm sure this gives validation to many people. And they're now a bit more relaxed that even the top guys are doing this. So 
I I want to know how do you view the whole experience of life situation also like do you think life is meaningful our actions are con- the consequences the karmic theory or is it all nihilism is it it is all meaningless you're just a speck of dust in this whole cosmos so what's what's your approach on it how it's you know you are you are what you eat you are what you put out you get what you give you smile if you smile you know it's the reality of life is that we are a speck but we are a speck that has the ability to live in a manner that gives that speck form function hope shape a uh, a uh, a uh, 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 path fulfillment that is in our hands how that speck matters to the world we cannot define we cannot change we cannot uh, influence we cannot um, control but how the speck is seen by others is in our hands how that speck relates to the world is in our control how that speck is remembered tomorrow is in our hands in our if we act today as we should we may be remembered positively if we act carelessly we'll be remembered as a waste of a human life so um, it's karmic theory is science at its best when we look at the vedas the vedas are a way of being it's a way of life it's not a religion the vedic hinduism is the most freeing way of thinking of life and living and prayer and uh, ritual because it says there is no reason to do any of that the uh, vedic uh, hinduism it gives you freedom to challenge gives you freedom to think it gives you freedom to be gives you freedom to fail gives you freedom to grow gives you freedom to be reborn gives you freedom to question god gives you the freedom to believe that there is no god gives you the freedom to think god is in you that god resides in the other that theory is so empowering and so freeing so i think that uh, we are a speck but we are a speck in charge of our own special journey and story and the sooner we realize that the happier we'll be the more successes we'll see but in the end if you're happy in who you are success and failure doesn't matter because when you put out your best and you know that you're only a speck what happens in return doesn't matter you live each day to do the best to keep giving your best to being one with yourself being being one with the planet and when you do that it doesn't matter what others think they don't define you they can't define you because they don't they can't defy you when they don't define you so when you realize that you alone are the sole uh, driver of your destiny and nothing else matters you forget to worry cry and smile about those extraneous things that can influence that's a very positive response i think why you want uh, a negative one <laughs> no 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 i'm very happy that you gave this positive response i was contemplating it inside my mind now i think that's that's very positive so uh, also like i would know i would want to know that since you have this very nice perspective on life but how do you deal on your off days when you're making like when you're in a bad phase of maybe cooking or in your professional or personal life so how do you deal with the down days the days when you don't have that intrinsic motivation what keeps you going So Dipu Dhawan maybe I'm an odd cookie I don't have days off in fact that's my problem I don't think of life as on days and off days I look at each day as a day I have to live and when you live with eyes wide open when you live with ears that hear when you live with a mouth that tastes hands that feel a heart that ticks a brain that thinks and a soul that's hungry you never have an on and off day you live each day to the best of your abilities doing only what you think in your head your little head and your little heart and your little brain and in your soul what's correct when you put out what you think is correct when you've given the best effort to every job you are asked to do by life and circumstance when you've treated everybody in your environment all around you and beyond you 
with respect and dignity and humanity and empathy and um, just uh, given them their due. You are not broken. You may not have food to eat, but you are smiling because you still have dignity. You may not have friends around you, but you know you've harmed no one. That there is a friend in you, that you respect the visage, that uh, reflection you see on the mirror. You sleep happy at night because you know you did nothing that would wrongly affect the planet or people you share it with. You uh, have hopes for tomorrow because you know what just happened is not a continuum. That tomorrow is a new day with new possibilities and opportunities where if you put your best, you still can shine again. So you never, you, they up and down, the good and the bad, the positive and negative, these are all words given by us, put by us into a dictionary. The vocabulary of our thoughts is made by us. We are mortal, we are prone to failure, and we fail ourselves by being caged by the, uh, uh, the constraints of these mortal thoughts. When we think beyond what is mortal and easy to uh, put in a box, when we live outside that box and yet we are inside our own heart, that's when we are happy. Because we don't, we are not caged by the failures that are surrounding us. We are seeing beyond that, getting that, catching that ray of light, the sun that's going to be rising, the gold in the setting sun, the brilliance of the moon, they give us hope for tomorrow. That the box around us is failing, but the hope is right there staring us at the face. I look at life like that. There are no ups and downs. There are no good and bad. I have to live, breathe, smile, sleep, cry in equal pride because they're all transient. What is good is as transient as what is bad. When we buy that, when we believe in it, when we understand it, we are not smiling in happiness and neither are we crying in what supposedly is unhappy and sorrowful because we realize they're both transient. They are, we, we don't own them. Neither one is owned by us. And that's when you don't, you're not, those emotions are going up and down, but you are, Subir is here. The emotions are like the wave, right. I'm here. Thank you so much for these peaceful and valuable insights that you gave. I think that, that it, that's amazing. You know, when you get to, because people like you who've achieved uh, a fair bit in life and you've done like great things in you being a chef, getting a Michelin star, that's like the top most achievement a chef can have. Being an artist and being the human you are, it gives a very peaceful vibe, the energy that you have. So it was a pleasure to talk to you, Sivir, sir. <laughs> no, Riputa, man, people that know me may tell you I'm not all that peaceful. Um, <laughs> I am, I'm always at peace with myself. People mm. around me may sometimes not find me peaceful because my parents, both of them, and my four grandparents and my parents' siblings. These are the elders that I've grown up with. They were Indians of a certain uh, ilk. They are humans of a certain kind. And they are responsible people that understand the gift that life has given them of comforts that a lot of people in our collective don't have. And they taught us to be restless when we see people being marginalized. They taught us to speak up when one of us is hurting another human. They asked us to be uh, shouting when we see bad things happening around us. They challenged us to never go to bed knowing that even one amongst us human beings was being broken by another of us. That if you're seeing something wrong, speak up, act up. A lot of people in today's world think of that as being restless and, oh, he makes too much noise. We were told to be noisy when it's essential and uh, not for uh, being happy when we won a prize. That was something disdainful. But make noise when there's somebody else being marginalized or hurt or being beaten or bullied. Speak up. Be smiling when the world does something good for all of humanity. That's when you rise and shout and scream, but never for personal gain. So I'm not always as peaceful as you think. I make a lot of noise. And I hopefully I do it for the right reasons. So uh, none of us should be peaceful. There are times that we need to be agitated and make sure that we speak out loud and clear. Message received, Captain. And I think that will be the emotion that people who listen to this podcast will relate. Thank you so much, Thank Sir, you. Sir, for doing this.
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Rupudam. And with this, we conclude this really awesome conversation. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be back again with another great episode.